Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar entitled Mitigating Fraud with a Payments Hub. In this webinar, we will discuss um, how, through utilising a payments hub, organisations can go some way to, to mitigating fraud. Um, we'll also highlight how Kribo is sporting over, gosh, over 2,000 of our peers worldwide with our SaaS payment fraud solutions. So before I introduce our speakers, I should introduce myself. My name is Vijay Katri and some very quick housekeeping rules. So um, firstly, we will be recording today's webinar. So if you have any issues in terms of um, you know, the call drops or for whatever reason it runs a bit slower, then rest assured, we will be sharing today's webinar. Okay. So let me introduce today's speakers. So first up, we have my colleague, Paul Simpson. Now, Paul Simpson is the payments director here at Kriba. Um, and Paul's been in the payment sector since leaving university, what, gosh, 30 years ago. Um, he regularly attends workshops with uh, the likes of Pay UK and, and Swift, for example, um, and is also attending many payment events throughout the industry. Following Paul is my colleague, Alroy de Cruz. Now, Alroy has worked within the finance and treasury sector for for over 20 years, including various treasury practices, uh, industry, treasury consultancy, and indeed uh, advisory services. Prior to Kriba, Elroy worked, for example, at uh, Associated British Foods in the treasury group, where he was responsible for, for daily cash management, um, cash forecasting, as well as FX dealings for group treasury and indeed the, uh, the subsidiaries. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to our first speaker. Paul Simpson. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much for that intro, VJ. And a very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for joining this session. I'm just going to overview the agenda for the next uh, 30, 40 minutes. There'll be questions and answers at the end as well. So if I just uh, set the, the context now of the agenda, what we're doing is introducing Kariba for those of you who don't know who we are giving you examples of what's happened in the industry in terms of fraud and also the current payment landscape. We're then going to move on to points of vulnerability, discuss different types of fraud, et cetera, and how a payment hub can help um, in prevent fraudulent activity. We're then going to look at the different types of uh, fraud, including best practice. It's also interesting that we'll be going through uh, what the difference is between rule-based and machine learning. Finally, we'll finish off by fraud detection and we'll give you some best practice tips at the end of today's session as well. For those of you not familiar with Kariba, let me explain that we have over 100,000 individual users. And I think what's really important is that we actually have and maintain 40,000 bank formats. So we have a team of dedicated people who constantly update and maintain these bank formats that means that you don't have to have anyone you know, doing this in-house or having to build you that format individually as bespoke work per company. We've got these built in in our library. Always astounds me that we provide a move outside of the banks, nearly 20% of the SWIFT global traffic. It's a huge figure. You know, as I say, this is outside of the banks, of course. As an organization, we turn over in excess of 100 million pounds. And we like to be seen, even though we're obviously very large, we still like to be seen and known as a FinTech organization. As you would expect, you know, with that many users and bank formats, we do have international and domestic capability, payment capability built into our platform. And just a couple of other bullet points for you is the fact that we are growing, even in today's current climate, by nearly 40% year on year with our growth rate. And that's because of the built-in business continuity being cloud-based, being SaaS-based that we'll go through after. So all told, we have 2000 customers, as you heard BJ explain, across the globe. But the beauty is they're all operating and working on one single entity, one SaaS solution. And this means it's easier for us to maintain provide updates, et cetera. Everybody is using the same platform. So can I just explain uh, for a moment a little bit about Kariba and where we sit? So many of you may have known of us or might already be using us for treasury management. However, we do have other modules 
So outside of treasury management, for example, today, the focus is on payments and fraud. And then we have a working capital mo uh, module as well, risk management. And when you combine all these different elements with the integration we provide into banks and into third parties, we absolutely believe we are the most integrated financial technology company in this space than anyone else out there in the providers in the sector. What I'd like to explain in a moment, we're going to be looking at some details around payment hubs, but I think it's important that we realize that when you are looking at a payment hub, there are three or four key things you should be looking for. And we'll go into these in more detail after, but you, know, you must be looking at standardization. So having a set of controls, so whether you're in one country or across several countries, you should have a standardization for payment approval that remains the same, it's constant, no matter what country, no matter what system. You should also have built-in payment screening. So this is working in real time. So that's very, very important. So you're screening, you're looking at sanction lists, anything that's flagged up as an alert or an alarm can be looked at before the payment is released. And as part of the payment hubs functionality, it should also be providing visibility. So you can see exactly where you might be cash rich in, in one country or one part of your entity, whereas another part of your company or entity may be lacking in funds to pay off their invoices. So by having true visibility through a payment hub, you can best gauge how best for the liquidity and, and where you can move cash to or from. And finally, the fourth point, it's worth noting, and sometimes this alone can provide a return on your investment, is the cost. The IT no longer have to manage different multiple systems in terms of bank connectivity and creating and maintaining and running and producing bank formats. So a payment hub can actually save you money and in many cases provide you with a return on your investment. Now I'm not going to go on too much detail about the things that you've seen in the press. I'm sure you're only too well aware of some of the fraudulent activity that's happened. But these are just a few of the snapshots headlines that explain what's been going on. More so, if, if I can say this recently with coronavirus, because you know people are working from home and that's opened gaps in what was a very secure process and now become uh, decoupled and, and not as integrated. So you're seeing these type of um, fraudulent activities. I wouldn't say on a daily um, basis, but definitely on a weekly basis. And they're costing huge amounts of money. You know, you don't have to believe me or the slides. If you went and did a search in Google, you'll come back and find out that these stats are very, very true. And in fact, there's probably more updates and more fraudulent activity gone on since last week, since we put the slides together. So these type of things happen all the while. And what's interesting, and I still find this quite amazing, is that out of only four out of 10 Dutch corporates, have an anti-corruption and fraud policy in place, which really does surprise me. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to hand over to my colleague Alroy, and he's going to explain why this has happened and where the, the gaps are and the functionality and vulnerability. So over to you, Alroy. Thank you, Paul. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm gonna cover the landscape that causes a lot of the issues that Paul talked about. I will talk about the different types of external fraud scams. We will examine the vulnerabilities uh, that organizations are exposed to, and then some ideas of how organizations can solve this problem. A lot of organizations that I talk to have challenges around managing the connection between the internal systems and the banks. And these internal systems can be composed of ERPs, um, treasury management systems or mainframes. So we often see customers with one ERP, maybe a SAP instance or multiple SAP instances. We often see customers with two or three ERPs, maybe an Oracle, maybe a Microsoft. We might see a client with a treasury management system. Maybe it's a SaaS, maybe it's a cloud, maybe it's on-premise. Sometimes speak to insurance firms that have say an AS400 that needs to produce AP files. And these fraudsters, they're looking for landscapes such as these, where there's a lot of complexity in the picture, like you see on the screen. What we find is that in a landscape such as this, each ERP 
is managing its own separate connections to the banks. And each ERP may have its own workflows on how payment gets approved and processed. These ERPs might be within the same country. They might be different ERPs in different countries. Essentially, there are non-standardized workflows that are processing commercial and treasury payments globally. Now, the implication of this is that the greater the number of ERPs and the greater the number of banks, this would result in an increased number of connections within the organization who don't have a centralized method. And then what tends to happen is that the more the controls and organization needs to put in place to mitigate that risk. So really, when you're looking at a map like this and you're looking at the complexity around this, it's easy to find gaps and holes because it's hard to put a standardized process and procedures around all these different banks and all of these different back office systems. I'm now gonna provide more flavor around what kind of fraud we're referring to. And really, there are two key categories of families of external fraud scams. The first one is what is known as business email compromise. And the first form of business email compromise refers to those situations where you might receive a request impersonating maybe your CEO or your CFO. And I suspect many of the people on the call might have been subject to this kind of an attack. What the fraudsters typically do is they might change a letter on the extension of a company name. So for example, let's say the CEO's name is Adam Smith and the company is called Orona. The email address might say adam.smith at orona is with an s.com, directing the receiver of the email to pay a new supplier. And what the fraudsters might do is they might also track holiday or certain times of month where a junior person in accounts payable or in treasury might be more vulnerable to act on a certain type of communication. The junior person might be in their own. They might not fully understand the background of the CEO or the CFO, and they might want to quickly get a payment through. And our clients are coming to us to help them solve these kinds of problems. It might also be that there might be an external consultant who is covering for someone who's on holiday and fraudsters might be aware of this and they wait for this point in time to carry out an attack. Now the statistics we see are that 62% of respondents say that accounts payable department is the most targeted with treasury at 17%. The second version of the business email compromise is around request to change supplier account details. And again, I suspect many of you might have been subject to this. What the fraudsters are doing in this case is that they're looking up LinkedIn profiles to identify those individuals within an organization that are responsible for changing vendor master data. What they then do is they use these LinkedIn profiles to create an email conversation between two or three individuals within that organization to request a banking change. They send the email to the person who's actually responsible for changing the vendor master data and also whole, and they CC the whole chain of individuals within the organization to request that banking change. And very similar to the first case I described, they might change a letter on the email extension so when you get the email in Outlook or in your inbox, it might say it's coming from ABC vendors when it should have been coming from ABC vendor. Everything looks the same. They have the same pleasantries. Thank you for your business. Please find attach a new instruction for invoices going forward. And really to an untrained individual with poor workflows tied to management of um, vendor master data, that individual would then turn and go and actually change the banking instructions uh, and execute the payment to the wrong account and that ends up in the wrong hands. So the fraudsters are getting really sophisticated and are coming up with newer and newer ways to attack organizations with gaps in their workflows or controls. So these are some things you should be aware of and communicating internally across the different business lines, not just in treasury and AP, but even to those individuals that do invoice approvals.
The final category of business email compromise is an email received from the IT support team asking an employee to download a certain type of software. Now again, the email looks like it's coming from the IT team, but it might have a letter change in the address and in essence, the software is malicious. This malicious software, once downloaded, would enable the fraudster to gain access to the employee's credentials and track when that employee logs into banking portals and conduct fraud at a later time. The second type of external fraud scam is business telephone compromise, right? Um, this is a scenario where fraudsters are using social engineering as well as technical engineering to identify the individuals responsible for executing payments. And they're also able to obtain data on the organization's supplier base. They then use that information and create a fake caller ID. So when they're calling you demanding payment, whether they call you on your mobile or on your desk phone, you actually see the supplier's name come up. So if you don't have the right processes, the right workflows, the right controls, you might be prone to execute on this payment because of the perceived urgency of this request. Now, in this slide, I'm gonna talk about some of the areas of vulnerability that organizations are exposed to. Let's start with connectivity. Now, connectivity, this really encompasses the connectivity between your ERP systems and the banking portals. Many global organizations that we help out start off with a disparate landscape of multiple ERPs, multiple banking portals, and multiple connection points between the banks, as we saw in the earlier slide. In some cases, some payment files from the ERPs are manually uploaded to banking portals. In other cases, there's a file that's deposited on the organization's server somewhere before it's picked up by the bank. Now, in the case where the bank is picking up the file, are those connections encrypted or are the payment files allowed to be opened up and modified? These are the types of questions you should be asking yourself. And really, should you be having those many systems with those many connection points? Or should you be having a centralized hub to globally control all of the various payments with standardized workflows and fraud protection around it? Now, the second area of vulnerability is around payments. So do I have the right visibility around all my payments and detection rules across all of my payments? What we tend to see with organizations that come to us is that they have different controls and different approvers in different regions. And what tends to happen sometimes is that because of different time zones, regional treasuries or the shared service centers require lesser number of approvals due to limited staff. And that can be a potential source that might lead to fraud. And then there's the supplier verification. If there are not the standardized workflows and controls in place, and the payment is being manually keyed into banking portals, the question is, is the supplier being verified? Are the invoices being verified to ensure that the payment that's going is going to the right supplier for the right amount? Do you have the right level of approvals if the payment is over a certain amount? The next one is compliance watch list. Are you aware of the places that you pay? Are you talking to your banks and ensuring that you're aware of the OFAC countries, sanctioned countries, and that you're not making payments to any of those countries? Now, Paul is gonna speak more about this shortly, but just to touch on it over here, do you have the right application security settings? So things like soft token and hard tokens are used rather than just an ID and a password. Now, another really important one is, do you have regular reviews or refreshes to check that the settlement instructions are accurate for all of your trading counterparties? Um, I recall when I was in, in treasury practice, we would set up settlement instructions for all of our main banks across a range of currencies. But then we might not have actually traded that particular foreign currency pair with that bank for a while. And it would be really important to make sure that the settlement instructions have not been tampered with on our side before any FX trading is done with this bank. So another really important one is signatory management. Do you have a master list of authorized signers by account? 
designating their level of authorization? And are you being alerted proactively when a person is about to leave the organization? Or are you changing that leaver's access immediately or waiting to do it for a few weeks or months after that person has left the organization? Now we covered a lot of points on this slide. I just wanna summarize and pick out one of the most or the biggest challenge that organizations face that we help them solve. And that's around connectivity. Specifically, the more the number of ERPs they have, the less the number of controls you're able to put around that, and it becomes difficult to manage different payment files as we saw earlier. The more the number of banks they have, the more the criminals try and put fraudulent claims against those. You may have remote regions, remote geographies, smaller banks that don't necessarily have controls and processes in place. Customers might rely on banks to protect them from fraud. You may have a bank in Indonesia that doesn't have that policy and fraudsters know this. So anytime you see an increase in ERPs or banks, we see that risk increase dramatically. The good news is that all of these problems and scenarios can be solved for with the right combination of attention and focus. Now, Paul is going to talk more about best practices shortly. Um, but first, we have to make sure that the controls and processes that are put in place um, are correct across the enterprise, right? So we see best practice as having one single connection point to all the banks. So a solution like Kariba provides that connectivity as a service where we manage the direct connections to each and every bank. You don't have individual ERPs running and routing all the different payment files to all the different banks which makes for complex controls and processes. You don't have an office in Europe and an office in the US having different ways of how they manage connections to those banks. That environment provides a lot of risk and essentially potential for a lot of fraudulent activity. So in an application like Kariba, we actually take a single, take a single file from the bank, um, sorry, from the back office of ERP system. We do the transformation of that file. We do the connectivity. We manage all the formats and we send that payment to the bank. But prior to that, we can implement our fraud and compliance detection controls around that. And Paul's gonna cover that now. With that, I'll hand over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, very enlightening. So I'm now going to continue from that. Um, we're going to look at a recent survey. And um, this was done by the AFP. And the survey actually went to global uh, corporates and ask them what would make their global payments more secure and there were five points that came up however I want to concentrate on actually which organizations have implemented what in terms of preventing and reducing fraudulent activity so I think it's really interesting to look at that under 70 percent of corporates actually have dual plus controls so this means more than one person actually approving and letting that payment go. The second one we need to look at is multi-factor authentication, whether this be a soft or hard type authentication. This is where you can link into the bank, for example, and you would be asked to provide a password or a live number or pin code that changes. So it's very important that you get this multi-factor authentication and under 50% of organizations use that. So there's a massive gap in the number of organizations that should be using multi-factor authentication. Then we have only 9% of organizations that are using online real-time monitoring payment screening, just 9%. But look at this figure here. You know, machine learning, AI, people have heard about this. How many people are actually using it? just 3% from the survey. And that's a real shame because as I'll explain in a moment, you know, machine learning is so valuable and can add value along with your traditional rule-based, um, fraudulent rule-based checking. So we'll come on to that in just a moment. If we look at the next screen, I just want to explain to you that within a payment hub, you should have what we call a centralized cockpit or dashboard. And that will actually show you and detect potential fraud or maybe a break in compliance with sanction or AML. 
what we need to look at from a fraudulent point of view is what is a customizable workflow rule and what is a machine learning rule and how that differs from a machine and business learning. So what I'm going to explain in a moment is how that differs. And at the same time, you must have and be able to perform sanctionless screening in real time as well. That's to avoid, you know, penalties, reputation, etc. So let's look at how and what you should be doing from a best practice point of view. I mentioned earlier that you should be looking at a SaaS based platform. And typically, you know, IT departments are all moving across to SaaS and the cloud. What people must do is to stop using just their user ID and password. It's not good enough, it's not strong enough, it can be broken. You mustn't rely on just ID and password. You must have a very, very strong password policy. And as I mentioned before, you should be using multi-factor authentication, whether that be a hard or soft token, where a challenge is given for another sign-on or approval method to actually release the payments and all data should be encrypted very very important so that if someone could get into your system they can't change a sort code or account number or an amount so how does that look in terms of standardizing and consistent controls which are really important and as should be part of a payment hub so what we do is if we look at the screen you'll see that any payment you're making should contain some backup documentation now I know this is hard when people are working from home, but really the idea is if you're going to release a payment, you need to see you know, the paperwork behind it, the purchase order, everything should be lined up and backed up to making that payment. And that can be quite tricky and hard to do, especially working from home, compared to when you're in the office and you could just go next door and see your colleague uh, and check the paperwork. Then we have dual approval. So you should be using, as I've mentioned, dual sign off. Now I've put dual plus because if you can get three people involved in that process, even better, then the payment hub should give you a centralized payment view of exactly what payments are where, your cash, where you're lacking cash, it should give you all that visibility from all your different host systems, which could be a combination of ERPs and other host software. You should have built-in consistency in terms of workflow and approval, automated confirmations, and you should set payment rule limits. So if you go over a payment rule, it should flag a warning to you. I've already mentioned that data should be encrypted and that you should have real-time visibility and tracking of every payment you're making. So through a payment hub, it should give you all these functionalities and more, and also help prevent fraud as well. I think what's happened recently with people working from home, you know, masses working from home, is that a lot of staff were not properly educated because it all happened so quickly. You know, Monday they're in the office, Tuesday they're all working from home. So I would say to you, you should have what I would call a crisis manager or a primary point of contact or a point of contact, someone that is actually sitting there and realizing how it used to work in the office to how it's now working based at home so you know you need someone to be in charge of this so that can look at the business and the finance and make sure that everything's being adhered to and there are no gaps ideally and people didn't get time to do this as i mentioned you know one day you're at work the next day you're working from home ideally this should be documented processes now you're working from home or people may be in the office and at home training you know that should now be taking place because who knows if this crisis will come back again this year, or maybe there'll be a different crisis next year. So, you know, you can't say this is the end, even though things are looking like they're improving. You have to say what happens, what if? And then, of course, communication. Unfortunately, very many um, organisations were rushed into working from home, and perhaps they didn't spend as long as they should have done in terms of communicating what the process was, in terms of signing and releasing payments. I've mentioned several times now, and you've heard my colleague Elroy mention this as well, that real-time payment screening is really important. And I want to give you some examples of how this should work. So if you're making a payment to a new supplier, or someone says to you, can you please make payments to this bank account because we've changed banks, then ideally that should flag up and you should check to see 
Is it fraudulent activity or has that supplier really now got a new bank account? Then you should also look to see if there's any changes being made from when the payment was imported into the payment hub and that should be flagged up as an alert or an alarm. And then of course, making a payment to a country where there is no known supplier, that should be flagged up straight away. So I'm gonna spend just a moment explaining the differences between rule-based and machine learning, fraud prevention. So typically an organization before the coronavirus situation may have been making four payments a month to a supplier. Because of the impact on business, etc., they may have dropped down to making two payments a month to that supplier. So it's within the four rule-based uh, payments per month. What then happens as we're coming out of the situation and the crisis, organizations are picking back up their business level. So it may well be that I'm now starting to make four payments a month as I used to, to my supplier. So in theory, the rule based will say, oh, you're still making four payments or less. So I'm happy, I'm not gonna flag that up as a warning. However, if you have machine learning, which is thinking and acting like a human, it's going to say, well, hang on, you were doing four payments, it dropped to two for the last three months or four months, now it's gone up to four. So it may well be under the rule-based um, workflow limit, but I'm gonna flag a warning up that it's changed, the pattern has changed from where it's been for the last few months. So that's the difference between rule-based and machine learning. And obviously using both is a very, very powerful way and the best way you should do that to prevent fraudulent activity. So other examples I just want to go into where fraudulent activity can be prevented is if you have a threshold of paying a company, say quarter of a million pounds, it should never go above. You know, there have been cases where people have paid 200,000 pounds to a make-believe organization, and then they've gone off and they've made another 200,000 pounds. So one single transaction is underneath the limit, the ceiling limit, but combined, of course, it's over. So you've got to make sure you've got that ability to detect that type of activity. And then of course, what about payments not consistent with the normal payment dates or history? So maybe you paid a supplier at the end of every month and then suddenly you're making a payment halfway through the month. This is where technology could step in and say, machine learning, flag a, a warning and alarm to you and say, it doesn't look quite right, it may be, but you should investigate and just check everything's okay before you release that payment. So what I would say to you, now more than ever is the time that you should look into how you can improve or enhance your business continuity plans. So if you are working from home or you plan to keep working from home or you fear the next crisis may mean you are working from home, you need to look and work out how a payment hub can actually enhance your business continuity plan. It has to be SaaS based to do that and that allows you to build in workflow approvals and keep the same workflow consistent with how you were in the office. It should reduce cost. What do I mean by that? It should ideally give you a return on your investment. What it should do is enable your staff, especially from an IT perspective, to say that they don't need to maintain payment connectivity, payment formats, multiple solutions, multiple payment formats. It can all be done in one centralized place through a payment hub using, if you recall from earlier, the file formats, the bank connectivity, the bank formats we maintain and have on behalf of our customers. So we're doing all that legwork for our customers and they don't need to go and do that themselves in their IT department. It is a must that you look to improve controls and that you at least standardize workflow and approvals. And again, a payment hub should do that for you there should be no way of overriding a payment hub's standardized workflow and approvals. It's in there, it's built in, it has to be adhered to. Then of course, I mentioned several times, and, and so is Al Roy, that you need to have real time fraud detection in, pro, in progress. It's a process you must have. And that also, because of the bank formats, the connectivity, means we can give you some bank independence 
in that you don't need to go off to your bank to get connectivity and file formats changed. You know, we're doing all that for you and we're routing the payment the most efficient and best way, depending upon the value, where it's going to and the payment method. Finally, and some people have different views on this, so I'll give you my view. Ideally, you should have straight through process, straight through processing of files. So on one hand, I've just been explaining to everybody that you need to have workflows, et cetera, and approval. On the next moment, I'm now talking to you about going straight through. Uh, and what I'm trying to explain here is you need the best of both. So as much as possible, have it automated, have straight through processing, but actually have standardized workflow and approvals and make sure that someone or two or three people in that process are releasing the payments. So you are combining manual approval and workflows with as far as possible straight through processing. So no one gets to touch that file before it arrives in the payment hub and before you then release that payment file. So I hope those points have, have been of interest to you. What I would like to do as we're coming to the end of the presentation is to explain a couple of things. Um, we have one of my colleagues, Luke, who's based in the Netherlands, and you hopefully can see his contact details, your local contact for the Netherlands, on the bottom of this slide. And he'd be only too willing to engage with you, explain which customers we already have in the Netherlands using our solution, how we've been able to help them. But we'd also like to offer you, uh, we can provide this live link to you, or you can obviously have a copy of the slides or make a note of the link. And what we're willing to do is enable you to go along through this link. It's a 20, 30 minute process to complete a health check. And then we can come back to you. The process will go through various things and it will come back to you and actually indicate where there may be gaps in your payment process and workflow, where there might, you might be open to fraudulent activity. So it's a great idea that this will actually go through a health check and work out any vulnerability you may have in your payment process. So with that, I'm going to say thank you all very, very much for listening to myself and my colleague Alroy. I'm now going to hand back um, to Vijay. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Alroy. Some really interesting uh, stats there. Um, very eye-opening. Uh, so as Paul mentioned, we are opening the floor to uh, any Q&As you have. So if you look along the bottom of, of your screen, you can see a little uh, Q&A box, if you like. Um, so please enter your, your questions and, and we will endeavor to answer it. So let's get us underway. So the first question, let's have a look here. Here's an interesting question. Um, so what, yeah, so what should be the minimum implemented measures to prevent fraud? I'll throw that up to you guys, Paul and Alroy. Okay, would you like me to answer that? Yeah, one? yeah, sure, please, please. Yeah. Okay, so the minimum, yeah, I think if we just referred back to a couple of my slides, uh, I was explaining that you must have various processes in place, best practice. So you should be ideally looking for a workflow with rule-based and also machine learning capability. And you know you should really have multi-factor authentication. So if you adhere to that with a payment hub in the middle, then you know you have visibility of where all those payments are going. It's standardized controls, and that's best practice. And it doesn't matter what country, what time of day it is, there's a standard process for making payments. If you can adhere to that, then that will absolutely reduce your fraudulent uh, preventive attacks on your system. Okay, thanks. That's another question here. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see. Let's see. So, how, how do we make sure there are no breaches outside of the payment hub process? So, for example, someone changed um, data in your in your ERP. So, go again. Yeah. So. So it's a great question. So we actually solve this issue for a, a lot of our customers, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, if Kariba is used as a centralized payments hub, we store um, payment history within Kariba. A payment from an ERP comes into Kariba, we compare the static data um, in the payment request versus what's actually stored historically in Kariba. And if there are any changes, for example, to a bank account details or other pieces, that will get flagged up as part of the fraud detection uh, checks. So it will quarantine that payment for review. Got it. Hope that's clear. Thank you. Um, let's see. We're on time. Okay. So let's have a look. Another question here. 
It's a similar question, actually. Um, I have multiple ERP systems which are implemented at different locations uh, worldwide. So how does forward prevention work in my case? Hmm. Yep, I can pick that up as well. Yep. Um, so again, uh, back to my previous slides, within a platform like Kariba that has both um, rule-based and machine-based learning that Paul talked about, all payments from different ERPs, whether it's a SAP, whether it's an Oracle, um, are rooted into Kariba. And within Kariba, we conduct all the checks on any of those payments. So you could have specific rule-based checks for certain category of supplies in, in the Netherlands uh, that come from one of your ERPs. And on top of those rule-based alerts, we could strengthen those with machine learning alerts, right? So all that an organization needs to do is send a file to Kariba from any ERP, and Kariba will manage the transformation of the file, as well as all the fraud detection around each of those payments. Great, great. Thank you, Alroy. So any more questions? I think that is the final one. I could perhaps give another few seconds for you to enter final, final questions. Um, so whilst you're doing that, I'd just like to reiterate, you know, our contact details are on there. Um, do reach out to either Paul or Alroy or indeed Luke, our local contact. And as Paul mentioned, we also have the payments, uh, payments health check. So the link to that payments health check is in the chat box. So feel free, click on the link, fill in the form, um, and one of our value engineers will reach out to you. Uh, so no more questions. So what's left for me to say really is, is thanks for everyone to, uh, to join our webinar today. I know everyone's very busy, especially at this time of the year. So thank you once again and uh, have a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.